Hello and welcome to another Hour in the Buff here at Lake Street Tavern. I'm John Woods of the Ralphie Report and I'm here with Adam Munster Tiger of BuffStampede.com. How's it going, Adam? You sound very serious, but I can't blame you because we got to start out by talking about some uh, Colorado football and then you get to talk a little bit basketball with Will and uh, I'm, I'm the sacrificial lamb here to talk about the uh, football program, so let's do it. All football today. It's uh, one in. Uh, one win, Washington State pulled off, and then we uh, haven't seen much positive happen since then. USC did not cover, 50-6 loss. There uh, wasn't a whole lot of uh, a good that happened in that game. You've got players and uh, you've got fans questioning the coaching staff. You've got players asking if there's enough people putting in effort. What is the mood at this point around the program? Where did those comments from Parker Orms and I believe Ray Polk come from? And is, this a, is there the danger of this thing kind of going off the rails this year any more than it already has? Well, first off with Parker Orms and Ray Polk, kind of questioning whether everybody on the team is giving 100%, especially in their preparation for games. And I think when you talk about the mood, I think right after a game is when you're going to get the most honest reaction. And uh, when you get to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they're back. They got their heads back up, and they're looking, looking forward. And obviously, as a, as a CU fan, that's what you would want to see. You, the last thing you'd want to see is those guys moping around in the middle of a game week. But after the game, certainly, it's this constant just sad, somber mood that, that's around the team and the coaches as well because these are very competitive guys. And so uh, you know, it's one of those things. Every loss, I think, amounts a little bit more on these guys. Uh, I don't want to say they've lost the coaches have lost the team yet though I mean they, I, I think though you're in danger of that happening with some of the the older guys but the young guys hey I mean they've got a lot of these true freshmen they got three more years so they're going to be a little bit more positive about things that might upset some of the veteran guys though that say hey this is my last year or one of my last two years and you guys got to give 100 percent now and not wait uh, until you're upperclassmen because this is my shot so um, I think you start to see more of a divide Obviously, anytime there's there's losses, I don't think it's gotten to the point though where they're not going to go out there and give an effort. And is there at this point with the coaching staff, is there any kind of doubt creeping in? Again, last year was the first year there was Vietnamese and, and Embry in their first seasons in that role. You've got some guys who fans are opening openly calling for or questioning it should Embry last through this season. Is Greg Brown the right person at defensive coordinator? Is that just a lot of kind of that passionate fan talk or is that some of that stuff actually starting to develop within the program? I don't think, I, you know, these coaches and players do a pretty good job insulating themselves. When John Embry was asked about those comments that Parker Orms and Ray Polk had made upon the game, John Embry at that point hadn't even seen those comments. So, um, and I think when you are losing, you have to get more into that bunker mentality. Um, as far as the speculation, I think Everybody realizes that John Embry is going to have a chance to coach them next year and obviously he's going to have to show improvement for him to stay off the hot seat. Um, as far as the coordinators and all that stuff, I, I think really they're, they're in week by week grind mode right now. And I, you know, obviously the players are hearing certain things on campus, and, but it's more just, hey, why aren't you guys winning? It's not, is John Embry going to be your coach next year? Um, so I think they do a pretty good job of blocking out that speculation. And you talk about the fan base. It, it's one of those things, kind of like the cliche that, you know, there's two uh, sides to every story. Somewhere in the middle is the truth. You got the fans that uh, are super negative and the sky is falling and, and this program is going to be doomed for eternity. Then you got the other side that, well, John Embry inherited this, this situation. It's somewhere in the middle. You know, there's some blame on the coaches. There's some blame on the players. And I think year three is when it's really going to come to a head in terms of, okay, is this the staff that's going to be here for the long haul? or are they going to have to go find another coach? You know, I think, I think it's good to hear you say that. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm on that far side where I say he inherited it. I don't think there's any, I don't want to say logic, but any truth to any, oper or any possibility that John Embry doesn't return next year. It, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to bring in a guy uh, after firing, getting a new coach two years after the, the wreck that was left after the Hawkins regime, giving him two years and then pushing him out the door and expecting another guy to come in and uh, start all over again. I think we know that Embry's going to be here next year. There may be a few changes to this coaching staff, but for the most part, these are the guys that we're going to be rolling with next year as well. I don't think the Buffaloes and John Embry are going to make wholesale changes. 
And I think that that next season, as you mentioned, that's the season where it's put up or shut up time. Does that mean compete for a Pac-12 championship? No, certainly not. That, does that mean challenge and hopefully make a bowl game? I think it absolutely does. I think if, as a fan, if you're saying, what is John Embry doing here and does he have the talent to do it? You just have to be patient and you have to wait for next year. Next year is the year where if there's some, for some awful reason, there's a start like this in the season and there's blowout games like this, then I think you can legitimately start to ask those questions. And I just don't think that this year, as a fan, you're doing yourself any service saying, who's the next coach that we can bring in to Colorado? What staff changes can we make? Because it's not going to happen. These is, this is going to be your staff next year for the most part. And I think we kind of have to just, as fans, we have to kind of just learn to uh, appreciate that. I, I, I like, though, that fans are passionate enough. Absolutely. The last thing you want to see is a fan base that says, I give up, I don't care anymore. So to see them debate this and get really fired up about it is actually a good sign. You know, and uh, the, I mean, I think having a front row seat as a media member, the hardest part of this is John Embry's passion for this program is unrivaled. There's no person on this planet that wants to win at CU and turn that program around more. So it makes it difficult. I know a lot of fans struggle with that too because he is a CU guy. And so that's a component of this that it's, it's tough, like I said, as a front row uh, media member to see this you know, situation the way it's unfolding right now. But he will be given that opportunity next year. And uh, we'll see, it. We'll see, like you said, put up or shut up time next year. And I don't, that wasn't, that wasn't a, an apathy. I, that wasn't a... Uh we should just accept that this is the Colorado Buffaloes program um, and that we shouldn't question the coaching staff, we sh shouldn't question the results because it's only year two. I certainly think that there's a lot of questions to be asked. I'm mostly just saying that it, it, you're wasting your time if you're expecting John Embry to be, get, to be fired this year because it, it, it isn't going to happen. But I certainly understand fans asking those questions. I agree with you that, it, that it, it's much better than seeing fans say, well, it is what it is, to quote Mac Brown, and just to accept what's going on. And I'm more of a positive guy, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm. It's hard to stay positive covering this team, though. No. I, I was sitting here planning for the uh, the show today. I said, "Well, we've got to talk something positive about the the USC game." And the truth is, there were some positives in that game. I, I was. It's hard to say when the score is 50, 50 to six. I swore that there was nearly no way that the Buffs wouldn't cover that spread. It was too big, and USC had struggled too much. But that's me being naive and uh, a little Homer there. But. There were some, some good things that happened. I personally loved the play calling. I thought it was the most creative play calling that I've seen from BNME consistently throughout a game this year. They moved the ball well, uh, long sustained drives. I think in other games we've seen BNME have a good drive here, a good drive there, and then all of a sudden the next drive, it's nowhere to be seen. I think we saw that kind of sustain itself a little bit in this game. Of course, we were undone by numerous turnovers in the red zone um, that, that ended up with us having six points on the board. Did you like the play calling? Were there other positives that you saw in that game, either from a, a unit level or a offense defense level or individual players? Well, the offensive line, as John Embry said, had their best performance of the season, particularly when you look against, uh, you know, look at who they were going against. Um, so that was long overdue, though. I mean, so you, you say the positive in that they finally play well, but it was a situation where that should have been the case week one or week two and so it took a while for those guys now it'll be interesting to see if they can, can carry that momentum going forward the play calling i agree with you was creative it helped them move the ball uh, really though i'm a bottom line guy the scoreboard is the scoreboard wins and losses and, and that's what you're judged by in college football and so you can say it's great that they move the ball but at the end of the day if you don't put in put it in the end zone it means nothing you know and so Yes, the offensive line played well. I thought the uh, play calling, you know, outside of the red zone was, was creative and it was, was fun to watch. And uh, that, that's about it. And defensively, I don't think you can really talk about any positive. No, let's not even go there. Individually, I think Vincent Hobbs is starting to come on as a, tie, a freshman tight end. And I think you're going to continue to see his role increase. And he's somebody that Buff fans can get excited about in the future. You know, everyone, I think, has the same plan. You want to go in there, you want to control the ball and eat the clock and you, you say all that, but it doesn't work out that way. I think, you know, some of it has to be them shooting themselves in the foot, you know, getting some turnovers where you give yourself a chance to score. Um, you know, you can, you're probably going to win the time of possession, but that doesn't matter. You know, it's a, you know, so... Uh, what you have to do is you have to play error-free on your side, and then you have to force them into some mistakes, and 
and uh, hopefully that's enough to, to be able to win. But, uh, you know, they go for it on fourth down. They go for two after touchdowns. I mean, they just, you know, their mindset that their team plays with is just different than, I don't want to say conventional football, but it's just different than uh, generally the teams that you're playing against. And so you have to be able to focus on, on what you need to do and not get caught up in what they're doing or you're, you're done. And I, I think it's interesting you mentioned Vincent Hobbs is a guy that's, that's starting to come on. And I, I feel like the coaching staff may think that too. They, it was interesting that he was chosen as a media representative today um, at the press conference. Do you think that the coaching staff is starting to gain confidence in Vincent Hobbs as well? Yeah, it, it's all, always been a mental situation with him as, as a freshman coming in. He's been that move tight end role. So while he is skinny, he can play that role without having to be a big bulky tight end. And he came in and... You know, for a true freshman to play at this level, it's, it's tough as it is. And then I know a lot of fans know about his situation at home. His father uh, is paralyzed. He, uh, they, they found a tumor on his spine and had to go in for surgery. And he's able to talk, and he's still in the hospital. So that's something weighing heavily on Vincent Hobbs. But give credit to him. He's continued to battle through that situation, that adversity at home. And he's continue, continued to improve. And, I think it was the Arizona State game where he got stripped from behind right when that actually could have been a big play for them to possibly get into the game late. And so um, Embry mentioned today during his press conference that three times when Vincent Hobbs was brought down, he was brought down in heavy traffic and the other team was trying to punch it out. And th that goes back to true freshmen. They have to experience these, these situations in games. Kenneth Crawley has to get beat like he's been getting beat in order to improve and, and move on from that because uh, it's one thing to take mental reps on the sideline. It's another thing to be out there with live bullets and uh, be a little bit embarrassed. I mean, and then you, you become uh, a better player because of it. A lot of guys will say that, that that's kind of the thing that fuels them from week to week. Eventually you get to a point where it's not mistakes that have to drive you to put your nose to the grindstone and improve. But for these young guys, it really is you come in and you don't realize how good some of the guys you're going up against are, and it, it takes that mistake to really uh, drive that week-to-week -week practice. You brought up the tight end position. Uh, it wasn't something I had planned on asking, but when I was watching the USC game, I find, found myself asking multiple times, why isn't Nick Kossip more involved? After the last two, three games where he had been a, uh, a big part of the offense and a guy that you had seen the light come on for, you had seen some real flashes from him that, that say, this, this could be our, our dominant playmaker on offense. Where was he in the, uh, in the game plan against USC? Well, I, I think at times USC was trying to take him out of the game plan because he had had some uh, solid games coming into that. There were a couple times he was open, though, and, and got missed. And we're, I think we're going to talk about Jordan Webb a little bit later and his pocket presence and his ability to move through his uh, reads. And that's one area that I, I think when Nick Costa was open a couple times, he just wasn't spotted. And so, I, I, but you have to be excited about his progression. I mean, it's. It's a shame, though, that he's a senior this year, and it yeah. makes you think, you know, how good of a tight end could he be at this point if he had started playing that as an underclassman. So, uh, but he's going to definitely be somebody that they're going to try to target uh, the rest of the season. Well, and with Vincent Hopps really coming on now, and then you uh, you have a guy like Nick Casa, and all of a sudden that tight end unit begins to look very, very strong. It is a shame that we won't have that for another year. The Buffs can't really exploit those weapons. Nick Costa is a guy with his size and his speed. Maybe he gets, uh, he'll get those training camp opportunities. Maybe he does develop into a guy that gets a shot with an NFL team. You were 100% you were right about the, the Jordan Webb comment. It was a great transition there. Um, let's move on a little bit from USC and, and look ahead to Oregon. I have to sigh when I say it, Oregon. It's a uh, Started at 47 and a half point underdogs. Uh, I think it's dropped the points. So someone in Vegas thinks we can uh, stay within 47, which I, I guess is a win. Well, uh, I think that's based more off Chip Kelly having this reputation for calling off the dogs. Yeah. He calls off the dogs in the second quarter in a lot of these games. So I think Vegas is more banking on that than they are the fact that Colorado is going to hold Oregon, you know, in, in cover from that end. <laughs> I, I feel like you're popping a lot of my positivity balloons today. And, uh, but it's true. It's true. And, and against Arizona State. They had that just ridiculous start, and Chip Kelly basically pulled most of the starters at halftime, uh, which allowed Arizona State to creep back in a bit, but that is true. I, I do think uh, that, that, that spreads a little high for that reason because I don't think with USC coming in the next week that he's going to really push, push, push right there in the fourth quarter. It's going to be close. Talking about the quarterbacks a little bit, 
like you said, Jordan Webb did make some mistakes, did miss some passes against USC. Uh, it wasn't all negative for him, but it certainly, when you look back at the game, it wasn't his best moment. John Embry's announced that he will be the starter against Oregon. Um, I haven't heard anything that says that there will be any sort of rotation and it will be Jordan Webb as the starter, as it has been. Is, do I, should I think differently about that at all, or is it the Jordan Webb show unless something happens, he gets injured or has to come out? Well, and the score being lopsided, and then you're going to get an opportunity to no. get Connor Wood in there to get some reps. Same thing happened with Nick Hirschman. I believe in both the Arizona State and UCLA games, uh, he got a chance to get some late reps as well. But no, they're going to go into this game, and Jordan Webb's their guy. Um, it, it's tough. If you're going to make that change, you probably don't want to do it on the road at Oregon. <laughs> You know, Connor Wood, yeah, he's got a little bit of experience, but do you really want his first start in that atmosphere? And uh, a reporter asked John Embry, does your decision to start Jordan Webb this week have anything to do with that? And he said, a little bit. So he, he did admit a little bit of that, but then he also said, looking at the uh, tape of the USC game, objectively he said some of the issues weren't on Jordan Webb. And obviously the offensive line played well, so what does that leave left? The uh, running backs and wide receivers. So um, you kind of read between the lines with that comment. Obviously, Jordan Webb does not have a very good pocket presence. I think we've seen enough mm -hmm. of him. He's basically now almost three full seasons, I should say two and a half full seasons, he's been a starter at the college level. And one thing his teams have struggled to do is win football games. And uh, if he stays out there, I believe this year, he'll probably end as the all-time losingest uh, college quarterback ever. So um, it, it's been tough for him. And I, I really do believe Jordan Webb is the type of quarterback, if you put some solid pieces around him, could win. He's a facilitator kind of guy, but you ask him to be a playmaker, it just doesn't work. We saw that, uh, especially the, the, the play that's going to stand out the most is that interception on their first drive. They're moving the ball, they have the momentum, and then he just makes a boneheaded play, a decision on second down. It wasn't even third down or fourth down, and he makes that decision. So um, obviously there isn't a quarterback that's going to save this team on the roster right now. The question, though, comes back to what, what, do, what do they have with Connor Wood? And until the coaches know what they have in Connor Wood in practice, but until he gets into a groove in games and gets an opportunity, a true opportunity, fans are always going to question what, what could be with Connor Wood. So do I think he's going to come in and, and lead this team to three or four wins down the stretch? I don't think there's a chance of that happening. I, I, so, but at least if they put him in there, let's say for Stanford or at Arizona or Washington, at least then you have a bigger sample size to kind of evaluate his skill set in a game day environment. Because there are guys that aren't necessarily great practice players, but they, they bring it on Saturday. Now, Connor Wood has gotten limited action. He hasn't looked very well, but it's a tough situation to come in the game when your team's already down by 30, 40 points to all, all of a sudden, you know, put together positive plays. Because the other team at that point is smelling blood in the water, and they're going to come at you. They're going to pin their ears back. So we don't really know yet what we have in, with Connor Wood on game day. It'll be interesting to see at some point going forward. And I, I have this feeling that at some point down the road in this season, he's going to get a chance to start, and we're going to finally get a chance to see what, what he brings on game day. You know, the game's it's slowing down to me. At first, it was really fast, CSU. Sacramento State, the game was like really fast paced, but now once you get used to it, it gets slower and the game gets slower and then you get used to it and I'm progressing as it goes and it's showing that the game is slowing down to me. Yeah, you know, it's difficult. They're a good team um, and they've got a great scheme, uh, but every, every scheme has its faults. Um, and so you just have to look for, for where we have the best chance against them and then you have to to rep that game plan and then you have to be able to execute it on the field. And um, that's, that's, you know, that's a week to week thing. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm excited to play these guys. They're a great football team. Um, and it's another opportunity for us. I think it's, I agree with you hundred percent about Webb. I think the one thing I've said for a while that I think he's that guy that, like you said, if he has weapons around him, he can get him the ball. He can hopefully not make mistakes in that situation. But we're basically in a situation right now. The Buffs are asking him to win games. They're not asking to. He has to. Uh, and he's just not that type of player uh, right now to make that to make that play and, and win the game. I, I do think it's interesting. You brought up the two next games. Embry did mention maybe Oregon played a part in Jordan Webb still starting. The next two games are they're, they let up a little bit from USC and Oregon, but they're they're not easy. I mean, you've got a Stanford team with a, a really solid defense, a, a ball control offense, 
Uh, it's back in Boulder. Do they make the call there? You got an Arizona team. Could be an interesting option on the road, but there it's a the defense is quite as good as the Buffs have faced the last three games. It's a shootout style game. They're going to score a lot of points. Is that a place where you give Connor Wood the opportunity to, to air it out a little bit? I don't know. It's going to be interesting to watch. Jordan Webb's a star in Oregon. At Oregon, we may see. Hopefully, we don't, but we'll probably see a backup uh, come in later in the game. Talk it's it's a. It's not a question of when. It's <laughs> if it's it's when. Yep. <laughs> not try. Not try. Do no, you no, have any left in the tank as far right. as your positivity? It's very very little. I hold on hope. And then, but in the back of my head, there's this uh, there's this realization. But I, I hold on hope. So, a little bit more on the on the, the offensive side of the ball, the wide receivers. Uh, what have we seen there? Nelson Spruce has continued to play well. Gerald Thomas's role has been increased. McCulloch's been steady. Had the drop. Uh, that he should have had, but he's, he seems to be learning to use his size a little bit more. Is that the rotation right now? Is a guy like Keenan Canty going to get a little bit more playing time as the season goes on? What do you think about the wide receivers as a whole? Keenan Canty is a little bit buried right now. Uh, part of it's a physical thing. He's a smaller guy, has trouble getting separation, and honestly, the guys that are in the rotation are having trouble getting separation, and they're doing a better job of it in practice, so I don't think you want to put out a guy that can't get separation in practice while those other guys can put him in a game situation. He he did okay last year. He subbed in for Paul Richardson when he went down, but I think part of that was Nelson Spruce was redshirting at the time. They didn't want to burn his red shirt. So I don't think you're going to really see a lot of Keenan Canty this season, uh, maybe in mop-up time. As far as the guys that are starting, again, I, I they're having a hard time getting open. And um, Nelson Spruce is the type of guy that I think can develop into a pretty good player, but he's not going to be your go-to receiver. And they're, they're asking those three receivers to do too much. Mm -hmm. If you have a Paul Richardson out there, it frees them up quite a bit. And so that's the problem right now is they don't have a playmaker at that position. And I talked to Paul Richardson today and he's uh, you know had a hard time watching from the sideline as we all knew he would. He's actually going to run track, outdoor track this spring and he's cleared for spring ball. I know they will limit him, limit him during spring ball because I mean he's their most valuable player going into next year. So that will open some things up. And then I think when they get Jeffrey Thomas back next year, um, he was on campus for a little bit and then went back home to deal with some personal stuff. Uh, he was a guy that physically uh, had it when he was on, on uh, early during camp, had some issues that were uh, distracting him. But So you have Jeffrey Thomas, Gerald Thomas now with experience next year, Nelson Spruce, Spruce with some experience, Paul Richardson back. Next year they still won't be a, a good or great wide receiver unit, but they'll be adequate. Okay. So I, I've seen a little bit, you, you tweeted a few uh, of updates from the press conference today. Um, I think it was Terrell Smith May is questionable for the game. Parker Worms has a concussion, is questionable for the game. And I, I know these reports change from day to day. It's Tuesday night, this video may come out Wednesday, Thursday, and be irrelevant at that point. But what are we looking like on the injury front heading into Oregon? Well, Terrell Smith's listed as questionable, so um, 50-50 is what I take that word to mean. Um, Parker Worms is listed day to day. It's, it's again, with concussions, they have this baseline test that they, they get tested at when they come in, and they have to reach that baseline after a concussion. So it could be a week, it could be two weeks, it could be three weeks. It all depends on how quickly they get over the concussion, and they're going to be extra careful with it. So um, I, I think Parker Orms finally stayed healthy for a little while. I mean, it was, I guess, Time, time for him to deal with some issues. You, you hate to see that, obviously, because he's a, a competitor. But uh, it, it's not on the players whether or not they get to play. It's on the medical staff. So it kind of goes up until uh, the day of the game, and, and you find out right before they play who's going to be out there. So Oregon, it, it is what it is. It's going to be a, an early day game now, at least. It's not uh, wait until 6 o'clock for the blowout to happen. It, this is the definitely the hardest game left on the schedule for the Buffaloes. It's a big spread. They're one of the best teams in the country. Their defense is significantly improved. Are they better than USC? We'll find out later in the season yes, next weekend. <laughs> I think they are as well. So we'll, we'll see how Saturday goes. It, stay positive, I suppose. Uh, a lot of people have asked. It's been a rough, rough season so far. And that first question is for, for big bus fans, especially those that follow recruiting, is how will this affect current recruits? How will this affect uh, upcoming uh, recruits. Two questions. Are there guys, have you heard rumblings uh, of any guys that are starting to question the decision? Or on the other hand, really not, not as much to do with the buffs, are there guys that are starting to play well and get more attention from other schools they may have not had previously? 
And then, uh, are there any new prospects on the horizon for the Buffs um, that may have not, may, may not already be committed or are on the radar? Well, it's pretty much status quo for the most part. Now, the two guys that everybody asks about, and it's because they are publicly out there saying, hey, if I get a better opportunity, I'm going to go. Tight end Mitch Parsons, uh, and even today he tweeted out that I'm getting stressed out from this recruiting process. I'm going to put it on the back burner. And Oklahoma was recruiting him for a while, I'm told they will not offer him. So that's a school that Colorado won't have to fend off for his services. Devin Ross, a speedy wide receiver from Southern California, is another guy that's been honest and said, if I can get an offer closer to home in, in Southern California, uh, I might take that and right now. Chances of him getting an offer? It, it doesn't sound likely with the USC. It's, okay. it's not going to happen with the USC. It's not likely with UCLA. That's a guy that they're keeping tabs on. Um, but you never know, uh, you know how this recruiting goes. They could get a decommitment, and then all of a sudden he pops to the top of their list. Uh, right now he does have an offer from Utah. I know he likes, obviously, Colorado more than Utah at this point. So uh, those are the two guys you're just going to keep monitoring up until signing day. And the rest of the guys, some of them have other opportunities. A lot of them don't. Colorado's still their best option. So I don't think you're going to see more than one or two decommitments, uh, even as bad as the season's gone this year. Here we are, another basketball season in Boulder, Colorado. It's exciting and, and uh, it's going to be a fun year. It's going to be a, a team that you're going to be able to watch grow and develop as the season goes on and, and continue to get better. And, and right now we are in the growth stage. <laughs> We've got a lot to, lot to work on. But practice has gone well. Uh, today we had practice number number five and well, number six, uh, six and seven this weekend. And um, we're off to the races. All right, we are back with William Whalen, new to BuffStateSampede.com. William, uh, is, he is covering a little bit of football, but his specialty is basketball as we move on to the basketball segment. How's it going, William? Uh, it's going great. I'm really happy to be here with Ralphie Report an hour in the Buff, and it's been a great first month over at BuffStampede.com and being part of the Rivals Yahoo Sports Network. So we talked about uh, football. I, I get to do both segments Ooh. here a little bit. Adam has Ooh. to kind of deal with the negative in the football <laughs> program right now, and then I get to at least transition over to you and, and get a little bit more positive, as I always seem to be, and, and talk about basketball. And it's been a rallying cry on the side as, as fans are struggling with the lack of success that the football program has, ha ha has had. It's, basketball's right around the corner. We're almost in November. We're weeks away from the first game. And there's just a ton of buzz, a ton of energy around the basketball program right now. There absolutely is. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. You know, I've only been covering the team officially for two years, uh, but loosely followed the program a little bit, living in Colorado before that. And this is something that is completely new to Buffs fans. Obviously, you had the team under Patton in the early 2000s, I believe it was 03, that went to the NCAA tournament. But I think people by then had started to get an idea that under Patton, this program, wasn't going to take off to the heights that I think most would hope that a basketball program can do. And now under Tad Boyle, you know, just going into his third year, he has created something absolutely special, exciting and unique in Boulder uh, to the Pac-12. And the move to the Pac-12 obviously has been very generous, generous to them, uh, both recruiting-wise, schedule-wise, and I think from a cultural, cultural standpoint. And I'm very similar. I, I'm not a lifelong Coloradan. I, I haven't I wasn't here for the glory days of the football program and the, the excitement that would be there and the fan support. So it's validation for me as someone covering the athletic department to see that enthusiasm, to see that support come so quickly for the basketball program. And it really was just last year that the C unit came out of nowhere and all this fan support, just so much so that it got national recognition. Uh, it shows that this, this school, this university, and this athletic program is dying for a program that they can get behind. Uh, you, you do hear in national circles people try and boulder there's plenty to do. They don't care about sports as much as us Nebraskans do. But I think that it's <laughs> become quite clear that that's not true at all and that when there's a winner on the field that, that, those, got, that those fans will be there. They're there all the time, I'm sure. Uh, but they're willing to come out in force when there's that winning program uh, on the basketball court or on the football field. Uh, I think today the program announced another milestone with uh, the tickets, or season tickets. There was an exciting announcement today regarding season tickets in Colorado. They sold over 5,000 season tickets uh, for non-students, and that is a program high. Historically, they have never done anything like that. The renewal rate from a year ago is over 95%. Clearly, people are happy with the product they're getting in Boulder, Colorado at the Coors Event Center. 
and the student ticket sales, they cap out at 2,500. So what you're looking at is from season ticket sales, you're gonna expect 7,500 people per night guaranteed. Now, there were some nights last year where it looked like those December non-conference games might not have gotten up to even 6,000. I don't think they're gonna have that problem this year. And as we all know, during conference play, the Coors Event Center became one of the premier places to watch a basketball game, cover a basketball game, play a basketball game in the Pac-12 Conference. And I think that excitement from last year really motivated people to go out this year, to buy those tickets again, and to ensure the fact that they get to watch a winner in Boulder. And you can see the Colorado fan base really rallying behind this team. And for the prices, I mean, there are some season tickets uh, packages that start at $60 per ticket for the season. That averages out to $4 per game to watch the reigning Pac-12 tournament champions. I mean, I, I can't think of a better deal in the Rocky Mountain region. So uh, I'll transition because that, that was a very positive story to that one scary, we're almost at Halloween now, how's that for a segment? <laughs> that one scary thought that sits in the back of every Buffalo's fan's mind is, well, is Tad Boyle a threat to go elsewhere? He, he's made that comment about this is his dream job. And, a lot of basketball coaches have made that comment. Is there any rationale to that rational to the, that fear? Is there something as this program continues to gain momentum where Tad Boyle could be, they certainly can be approached by a lot of other programs, but it could be a threat to, to listen to some of those others? Or is it truly a Kansas, uh, UConn, for example, that would, that would be required to pull away? I, I think yes and no. Um, the fact is it is every college coach's dream to coach at one of the elite places in college basketball. Certainly Lawrence, Kansas, where Tad Boyle played his college basketball, is one of those elite places in college basketball. You talk about Duke, North Carolina, you know, uh, the other schools, Kentucky, the Blue Bloods, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Schools like that are obviously the who's who of college basketball. But those schools open up, their jobs open up so infrequently that it really takes a perfect storm for someone to land that job. Bill Self, for example, was just extended past 2020. And I think everybody that supports the Colorado basketball program wiped off a little bit of sweat, took a deep breath, and kind of relaxed a little bit because I, I think it's well known that Kansas is probably Tad Boyle's top of the mountain peak. You know, if he reaches the pinnacle of his profession, that's where I think he would want to be. But he's got a great thing going in Boulder. Absolutely. And I think there's absolutely something to be said for winning on your own terms, winning somewhere that nobody historically has won at. I mean, I believe he, we, had, we ran a series of articles just a few weeks ago. It said Tad Boyle was, I believe he was second on all time postseason wins for Colorado basketball head coaches. He has been in Boulder for two seasons. <laughs> I mean, come on. Can you get better than that in terms of a start at a program? I don't think you can. So the administration is working on ways to keep him. Uh, sources have told me that there may even be some sort of contract negotiations going on. I don't have details on that right now. And obviously, you know, that information will release it as it comes. But besides that, he's in a place that he's very comfortable right now. And I think Colorado fans need to take some solace in that. Well, it doesn't look like Billy Gillespie is going to be getting a new job at any of the other Blue Bud schools, so I think right. that they will right. be there. The guys that are there will be there for a while. Shevsky, Roy Williams, Bill Self, Calipari, they aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, it, these coaching changes are a factor of timing, like you mentioned, big time. Um, and I think we're in a good place right now. There's no reason for him to entertain offers right now when this program's on such a historic upswing. Um, Every program will hit, hit that, those bumps in the road, but those bumps aren't coming quite, quite yet for this Colorado program. Um, it, so much so that to transition here a little bit, we've got the Buffs have a ton of returning talent, yet all the fans want to talk about is the freshmen coming in. It, it's one of the best recruiting classes that's come into Colorado in years, that's if ever. Right. And, and fans with all that talent coming back want to talk about the new guys because there is so much young, exciting talent there. Who do you think, out of, out of that big three or the whole entire class, uh, you, who's the guy, Xavier Johnson, Wesley Gordon, who's the guy that's going to make the most noise, you think, in their freshman season? I think, I think the biggest surprise maybe was the fact that Josh Scott all of a sudden became so highly regarded in high school. 
So fans' expectations went from, oh, glad we got a big kid, but he's from Colorado. Colorado, historically, not a very strong basketball state in the high school ranks. But of course, after his last summer on the AU circuit, Scott absolutely blows up, becomes a consensus top 100 player in the country, some having him as high as top 50, but comfortably in the top 100 range. And what I think is so important about that is the fact that the Buffs finally got a legitimate inside scoring presence. I think Josh Scott is the guy that every Colorado fan needs to, while you, you shouldn't expect necessarily a conference, you know, maybe not the leading scorer on this team, you should expect big things out of Joshua Scott because he's a big guy. Uh, he measures in at about 6'10". Now he's a little bit light on his frame, but he has plenty of room to grow into that adding strength. And his biggest weapon, a lot of people talk about athleticism at the college level. A lot of people talk about strength. But what they don't talk about is the fact that he is a technician under the basket. He can finish with either hand. In fact, he prefers to finish with his left hand, though he's a righty. He can shoot out to 15 feet. He can take a man off the dribble. His spin move, very, very effective, even against college players. While we talk about the fact that he needs to add strength, He's a little bit wiry, so when he gets his elbows up, he can seal guys off, and it's hard to get around him. His basketball IQ, sky high. I, I know I am singing the praises of this kid and possibly raising expectations too high, but Josh Scott is a legitimate NBA talent. Maybe not after this year, but certainly after his sophomore year. Obviously, you know, Xavier, uh, Xavier Johnson, Wes Gordon were the other two highly rated kids in this class. They have great potential. I think Wes Gordon could be a better shot blocker than Andre Robertson, and Xavier Johnson is gonna be a, an absolute menace uh, in the paint for the Buffs for years to come. Well, I know I'm fired up. I mean, it, 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 I'm awesome. glad I can no, bring some positivity no, after yeah, this football absolutely. segment. No, man. that was great, I, and I think it was in one of your stories, your stories today or yesterday, you had a quote from, I, I believe it was Shane Harris Tunks, talking about how he's actually taller than Josh, but yep. Josh's wingspan is eight inches longer than Shane's. To give you a, a, an idea of his size, and when you say wiry, when your arms and legs are that long, you're going to be wiry. You're going to put on weight, but you're not going to bulk up. Yeah. I think he's the guy that will add size, but I know I'm excited. And, and we got a little dose of that when, during the European trip, and that, those were his first games with little to no practice, thrown into the fire, playing against professionals in Europe uh, with no chemistry with the team. And he played really, really well. He led the team in rebounds, I believe, and uh, yep. and, and played consistently throughout the entire uh, the entire tournament. So I think that there's going to be there's, there's a high upside for him, as, as you mentioned. There's also a lot of talent coming back. Everyone knows a lot about Andre Roberson, but there's also two true sophomore guards, Askia Booker, Spencer Dinwiddie. What should we expect from those guys in, in year two? Is there that kind of sophomore slump, or are these guys going to con continue to consistently improve? Well, I think guys, should, people should look for a big year from both of them, especially Spencer Dinwiddie. Now, on Twitter, I recently put out a list of about 20 to 22 names of guys that I thought could compete for a first-team Pac-12 spot. Uh, I also put out a, a list of about 10 names of guys who could easily compete for Pac-12 Player of the Year. Dinwiddie was on both lists for me. Now, obviously, he was on the all-freshman team last year, and people came to know him because of his timely free throw shooting, timely three-point shooting, and his ability to get to the rack once in a while and finish because he's so long. Why am I so excited? Because he grew again. This is gonna be a six, five and a half oh, wow. point guard who added 10 to 15 pounds of muscle over the summer. I mean, we have pictures of him last year looking wiry. He looked, frankly, like a senior in high school. Now he looks like an all-out man. Uh, I, I think people should expect huge things from Spencer Dinwiddie, and I think his scoring output will probably be about the same, around 10 points, but the fact that he moved into the starting point guard role is gonna be huge for him, because now he can distribute the ball like he did in high school. As Kia Booker, uh, you, you gotta look for similar things. A scoring punch, his outside shot has improved. Uh, he can catch it off, he can shoot it off the dribble, he can do the catch and shoot game coming off picks. And what I think is more important about him is he also added strength. So now on ball defensively, where at times he struggled keeping guys in front of him when things got physical going to the basket, he can now do that kind of stuff. So you have 
the Askia that everybody knows, or Ski as everybody knows him, on the offensive end that excited so many people with dunks, layups, wraparounds, stuff like that, and now you have him on defense. Some people around the program are starting to call him the best on-ball defender, and that's on a team with Andre Robertson. So I, I think expectations should be high for these two sophomores. So we talk about what, for lack of a better word, are the stars of this team and the stars of this program right now for the next few years as we go forward. But any who, anyone who's a college basketball fan knows that it's to really reach those true heights, sweet 16, further than that, and to really be consistent throughout a season, you've got to have those glue guys. Yeah. You've got to have those guys that are the energy guys, they're the motivation, they're the scrappers, the guys that are diving on the floor no matter what, cuts, bruises. Who's the guy that's returning this year that's going to surprise some people, that may have not had a big contribution, that maybe didn't uh, always show up on the stat sheet that the Buffs fans are going to see a lot of this year? After last year, my pick for that role exactly was going to be Jeremy Adams. I thought he was a guy that obviously coming in with the diabetes issues, he could never quite get in rhythm in Boulder, but he's been injured all summer. So I haven't gotten a glimpse and you know, I'm at all the practices and we get to watch the players because Tad Boyle is very friendly with the media and I, he hasn't been able to play. Uh, so we haven't gotten a look at him, but who we have gotten a look at is old Sabatino Chen. Sabatino. I mean, the, this kid's story is an absolutely incredible one and I did a feature on him just last week, his journey from Monarch High School in Louisville to DU to possibly going to Northern Colorado when Boyle was there and now at CU. He's a high energy guy, as everybody knows. When he gets going, he's extremely quick uh, down the floor. What I think his biggest improvement on is his jump shot. Uh, he's a career, I believe, he didn't hit a three last year. At DU, uh, an offense known for creating open jump shots from beyond the arc for their, for their players, he shot under 34%, which is something that you, know, you, can't, you cannot afford to get out of your guard. And he's a little bit undersized. He's about 6'4", maybe 6'5". Um, and they, they used him as a utility role last year. And I look for similar things this year. But I'm telling you right now, it, over the summer, a lot of people started to pencil in a starting lineup of Dinwiddie, Booker, Robertson, Xavier Johnson, and Josh Scott. I'm telling you right now, do not be surprised to see Sabatino Chen start at that three spot and give Boyle a little versatility defensively. Well, I don't want to go into kind of the full season expectations yet. We've got a long way to go. We haven't hit, haven't hit the floor in a regular season game yet. So let's kind of start slow. With the Buffs open the season, I think it's November 9th against Wofford. Yep. And they, they really jump in immediately to the Charleston Classic. Uh, there's some big names in that tournament. Baylor, they open with Dayton. Uh, St. John's, I believe. Uh, uh, I, I, believe I believe this year it's going to be Baylor, Murray State, Auburn, State, yep. Boston College, CU, Baylor, um, and Dayton. I might be missing one. St. John's might be in there. But I thought there was something where they got switched out. It could have been because I, I think it was Murray State that got added in for somebody yeah. else. But there's a lot of big names there in that tournament. It makes the European trip so much more important when you talk yes. about uh, Absolutely. a team who's thrown into the fire one game into the season against a relative cupcake, and then all of a sudden that level of competition goes up exponentially. What are the expectations Buff fans should have going into that tournament? They start off with Dayton. If they win against Dayton and Baylor wins, they can have a rematch of the tournament. Brady Hayslip, I would love to get I mean, revenge. Buff fans I don't want to see any of that out there. They I really agree. don't. I think, I think expectations for this tournament, you know, I haven't made up my mind on it, but I think they should be relatively high. Dayton is, here's what it is. Dayton is a team that is tough every single year. They are one of the most consistent mid-major basketball programs in the country. They won over 20 games last year. Uh, Dillard is going to be a guy who comes in who was a transfer from Southern Illinois. He averaged over 12 points a game as a junior, I believe, or he might have been as a sophomore, but I believe he was a junior at Southern Illinois. And he was also named the Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year or Freshman of the Year when he first came in. So he's a guy that can play some basketball. And the Buffs are going to have their hands full. Dayton is known for guard play. They are known for wanting to get up and down the floor, and luckily for CU, they want to too. Um, if they should, if they should win that game, which if they're going to be the team that we expect them to be, they need to beat Dayton, and that could be a quality win come March when you're talking about possibly getting in as an at-large team to the NCAA tournament. The rematch with Baylor—that's tough. Fun. Baylor has a seven-foot-one freshman, Isaiah Austin, athletic, long, skilled. I mean, 
I would I would think CU comes out of that tournament two and one as opposed to the one and two they ended after their first tournament last year. So kind of the opposite of, of football here a little bit. I'm gonna we went talked all positive and I'm gonna have you end on I wouldn't say negative, but let's temper <laughs> expectations a little bit. Tell Buff fans one reason one reason why they shouldn't expect too much this season. I think it has to be the youth. I mean one of the one of the themes of practice so far for Tad Boyle has been youth is not an excuse. Um, and he wants these guys to realize that, yeah, you're young, but you're talented, and you have a lot of potential to do a lot of great things this year. I mean, people, people have picked Colorado to finish anywhere from second to eighth in the Pac-12. People have picked Colorado to make the dance, to make the NIT, to maybe struggle to stay over 500. The key to this season is how the youth picks up the system, executes it on the floor, and eventually meshes with the rest of the team. Because from my perspective, they have great chemistry thus far. I mean, the guys get along. You see them on the floor. They're starting to feel each other out a little bit. But with six freshmen, that is half of your scholarship to players are freshmen. And no matter, you have one senior in Chen, a junior in Andre Robertson. And Andre Robertson is an all-American caliber player. I, I, I will say it right now comfortably. He's an all-American caliber player. But still, you have to have four other guys on the floor with him. And this team has a chance to start two freshmen and play anywhere from three to four freshmen at a time. So I think at the end of the day, Buff fans should be really excited about this team. But I think they should be more excited about next year than this year. And Tad Boyle said that he might have set this team up with a little bit of a tough schedule. Uh, that might have been more suitable for next year. But while expectations should be high in closing, I think, I think people need to realize that there are going to be some growing pains with this Colorado Buffaloes basketball team. Well, it's going to be exciting to see. Um, I, I'm really, really looking forward to it. I know Buffs fans are ready to kind of move on, uh, not move on past football, but they're ready for some positive to come into, into their lives when it comes to Colorado sports. Um, I think that's, uh, that about wraps us for the night. I'd love to thank Blake Street Tavern where we shot here Absolutely. Tonight. Great supporter of Buffalo's Athletics. If you're in the Denver area, if you're just <laughs> passing through, make sure and uh, stop in for a beer, for dinner, lunch. They always have great watch parties here. Um, for Adam Munster Tiger, William Whalen of BuffStampede.com. I'm John Woods of Ralphie Report. Have a good night.